And now I don't have to give my talk. It's great. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm here Let's indeed. The first one. <laughs> I will. I'm here to tell you about retroviruses. I'm going to um, really concentrate most of the time on just trying to tell you about the, the lifestyle of these viruses, how they really work. Um, and I, I hope at the end maybe we'll uh, be able to summarize and think about some of the implications of this, this life cycle um, for the evolution of, of us and for the host. Um, because uh, these are viruses. Everything you've been hearing about so far today is true of these viruses, but they have some very special properties unique to them. Um, some capabilities that I think have important implications for, for the evolution of, of, uh, of higher organisms like ourselves. So, um, so I'll be talking about retroviruses. The one in my lab that we study mainly is shown here, a mouse virus, the mouse leukemia viruses, uh, shown budding from an infected cell. So uh, just to put the setting, as Arnie gave you, uh, of these viruses. So there is, I don't know if you've heard it in the, in the course of your uh, lectures so far, but there is a very famous classification of all the viruses based on their genomes. And indeed, as Arnie says, they're single strand, double strand DNA viruses, single strand, double strand RNA viruses. What they all share in common is the ultimate need at some point in their life cycle to make a messenger RNA that's translatable to make proteins. Uh, so we put that at the center of the scheme. And, and think of all these different virus styles as always, at, at a minimum, having to replicate and ultimately make messages that will make the proteins. So uh, in this setting of this array of viruses, uh, the, the very unusual ones are these retrovirus guys on the left. And they are RNA virus uh, particles. That is, the genome of the viruses in the virion is indeed a single-stranded RNA, as you'll see. Um, and its lifestyle of replication is to go through a double-strand DNA intermediate that's integrated critically into the host genome uh, and is used as the template to make its messages and ultimately its progeny virus. But it is that uh, very remarkable uh, ability to go from an RNA genome to double-strand DNA that persists in the infected cell forever that really is giving these viruses remarkable capabilities. So what do these guys look like in general? Here's kind of a rogues gallery. Uh, of, of these viruses. They are roughly usually spherical. They are enveloped. They have a glycoprotein in the, in the membrane uh, that determines their host range and the cell types they can infect. They're typically formed by budding at the cell surface. There's a bunch of them shown here assembling. Um, and then when they're released, they're roughly spherical. They're about 100 nanometers in diameter, plus or minus. They're, they're not perfectly homogeneous. They're, the sizes are, are, are uh, more heterogeneous than that, 80 to 120 nanometers typically. Um, so these are not you know, crystalline, perfect viruses. Um, the numbers of uh, the monomers that make up the brand are not rigid. You'll see that. Um, they come in a variety of uh, internal um, core shapes. Um, they're often spherical. Uh, they're sometimes uh, acentric, off-center. Um, some viruses uh, form cores that are cylindrical. Uh, probably the most famous HIV uh, core is a, is a conical shape. Yeah? And roughly how large is the largest subunit? So the, the uh, core uh, and the protein that is assembling these is the gag protein. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty conventional sized protein in the 50 to 80 kilodalton size. Uh, and there are uh, typically 1,000 to 1,500 copies per virion. We'll talk about that in some detail. All right, so that's what these guys look like. Um, if you strip off the lipid bilayer with detergent, you can isolate purified cores. Those are shown here. So these are the little conical cores of HIV, some more examples. But think of them as a, as a core particle contained in a, in a lipid bilayer shell. Uh, with a glycoprotein in the, in the surface. So these, as Arnie said, are very, very successful um, in evolution. They exist um, in, in all uh, vertebrates, certainly, and uh, versions of them, depending on how you define them, uh, really in all eukaryotes. The extant replicating viruses are traditionally defined into these groups. 
Um, these were originally defined on uh, such poor criteria as morphology of the virions, now much better defined on the basis of their sequence. Um, there are schemes in the works to redo these names, but I think these will stand for the moment. Um, so they are uh, gamma, epsilon, spuma, lenti, beta, alpha, and delta retroviruses. Um, their rough evolutionary tree probably correlates with this, with this tree built on the basis of sequence similarity. Um, there is some grouping of the types to species, not very strict, but for example, the alpha retroviruses are mainly avian. Uh, the epsilon retroviruses are, are mainly piscine in fish, so on gamma retroviruses in, in virtually all mammals. So these are, these are widely spread widely successful uh, extant viruses. Um, we'll talk first about the simplest retroviruses, the gamma retroviruses, which only really have three genes, three open reading frames. Um, and uh, the more complicated viruses can be noted by the acquisition of additional uh, genes, additional ORFs, um, which kind of uh, mark the appearance of, of you know, more advanced stages. Most of these added genes that have been uh, added in the course of evolution turn out to be genes that help the virus evade the immune system uh, and protect them. Indeed. So these are very old. So these certainly are hundreds of millions of years old. Um, some of the newer genes are thought to have appeared in the range of 10 million or so years. So these are these are old viruses. Uh, there's, an in, there's some issues, interesting issues, about the relationship of these to retrotransposons. Um, so retrotransposons replicate in the very same lifestyle that you're going to hear about. They differ in that they lack an envelope protein as a rule, and therefore they lack the ability to transfer from cell to cell. And most of their hopping, therefore, occurs intracellularly. Um, most people thinking about the evolution of these viruses imagine that the retro transposons appeared first as parasitic internal replicating agents that then acquired an envelope and became now capable of spreading from cell to cell. Um, yeah, there's a school of thought, which I think is wrong, that, that there was a virus uh, degeneration uh, losing envelope and therefore becoming uh, unable to spread from cell to cell. But in fact, the, the very primitive retro elements look to me, like they appeared first in simpler organisms. All right, so these are the extant guys that are running around in the wild today as exogenous viruses. Um, and of course, uh, the, probably the most uh, exciting for humans are the lentiviruses, uh, HIVs 1 and 2, which quite recently hopped from chimpanzees and great apes to people uh, and are spreading as an epidemic today. Um, but that is not unique to humans. Uh, uh, right now, there's a very serious epidemic of gamma retroviruses spreading in the koala bear. We'll come back to that at the end. Uh, so so these, these epidemics are clearly happening uh, at, at considerable frequencies uh, at, at uh, modern times. Uh, yeah? <laughs> yeah. So they, so they ran out of Greek letters or they stopped and uh, <laughs> lentiviruses were slow, hence the lenti, uh, and they're not really slow in any regard except for the appearance of disease. Um, but yeah, I, I, don't, I don't put much weight otherwise in this. The, the, um, you might be interested, the new nomenclatures are gonna, are, are, that are being proposed um, are, are being done by the Chinese groups and they're using non-Greek characters <laughs> in the naming of these. So, so, don't, uh, so hold your breath on whether the entire tree is rewritten in the next decade. But this is the current tree. <coughs> All right, so let me run you through the life cycle of these viruses, first in a very helicopter view way, and then uh, I'll go back through this whole life cycle again in detail, where we look at each step. So, First point, the life cycle of these viruses is very sharply divided into an early phase, meaning on the way in, and a late phase, meaning on the way out from the cell. So this is the steps that are occurring in the way in. So beginning with a virion particle outside the cell, 
Um, you need to know there are two identical, typically identical copies of the genome. They are diploid. So these are single-stranded, positive-strand RNAs. Um, they are capped by five prime caps, and they are polyadenylated, just like a message RNA, because they actually are messenger RNAs. Um, that's all wrapped up in a protein core. Uh, there's an envelope, a lipid bilayer, and a, and a glycoprotein on the surface of the virion. So infection begins with the binding of these particles to receptors on the cell surface, and we'll talk about those receptors. The envelope protein then mediates the fusion of the lipid bilayer of the virus with the plasma membrane, typically, of the cell. And that fusion then pops in and delivers into the cytoplasm the virion core. So there in the cytoplasm, in the first hours after infection, occurs this amazing reaction that Arnie told you, the, the copying of the single-strand RNA to a linear double-strand DNA, which means that you first had to make a minus strand DNA copy of the RNA, and then you had to use the minus strand DNA as a template to make the second plus strand of DNA. So the end of that reaction is a linear double strand DNA, um, still contained in some version of the incoming particle. So that DNA now in this structure called a PIC or pre integration complex then has to find its way to the nucleus and into the nucleus. Um, we, we know a little about that in the sense that the particle is trafficked on microtubules, um, probably with dynein motors, and then um, is delivered into the nucleus in different ways for different viruses. Um, the simple retroviruses, interestingly, actually don't have a mechanism to get into the nucleus, to get through the nuclear pore. They absolutely require that the cell go through mitosis. They depend on the normal breakdown of the nuclear membrane that occurs in division, in mitosis, and a strictly post-mitotic cell that's not dividing cannot be infected by those viruses. The virus will get in, make DNA, and fail completely at that point. Yes? So is the reverse cell trip phase responsible for the nucleus of the minus and the plus? It is, and we'll talk about that. Indeed it is. It does both. So it's a, it's a dual capable enzyme, and more than that even. Um, in contrast to that need for uh, mitosis, uh, some viruses, notably HIV, have evolved mechanisms to actually enter the nucleus of a non-dividing cell, and that gives them a new capability. They can now successfully infect strictly non-dividing cells, like some memory T cells, uh, and, and still uh, finish this part of the life cycle. So uh, that was uh, a clear advance that uh, uh, promoted uh, the spread of the virus into new cell types. So once in the <coughs> nucleus, the key step then after reverse transcription is the integration of that linear DNA into the host genome. Um, so that's a pretty remarkable reaction. Uh, it's quite efficient. Um, it's essential for the successful infection. Uh, it's required for if the subsequent steps to follow. If for any reason the integration reaction fails, and there is a, a failure rate, uh, that linear DNA is recognized by the cell actually as damage. Uh, it's ends, DNA ends are something cells are extremely unhappy uh, to see, and the appearance of, uh, of broken ends triggers repair enzymes that immediately work very hard to repair the ends, and they form circles um, either by the blunt end joining of the linear to form uh, so-called two LTR circles, we'll talk about that, or through recombination, single LTR circles. So these circles are not productive. They're not able to persist. Um, they're evidence of failure, um, but they are uh, useful as indicators of the viral DNA having gotten into the nucleus. Yes? So that's a, that's a hugely important question and a big field of study. Um, so the answer is to a, to a very rough approximation, it's random in the sense that the integrations occur without sequence specificity and on any chromosome. And yet, it's not totally random. There are biases. And it, the biases turn out to be different for different viruses. Um, these, are, these are small effects at some level. These are a few fold biases, four fold, five fold, 10 fold biases. And the kind of biases we're talking about are toward active genes. 
toward by prime ends of active genes in some cases. And, and these are, it turns out, directed by affinities of the incoming uh, integrase protein, we'll talk about that, for certain cellular proteins that are sitting in selected portions of the genome. So there's some targeting, but it's very loose okay, is the answer. No, they're, they're broader than that. Um, one of the, the most tightly focused is probably the Maloney virus itself, which really likes five prime ends. Um, it's because of its attraction to the BET proteins. Um, others like HIV are, are much broader. The, the, the distribution on a, on a given gene is basically a large plateau crossing all the introns and exons, very broad peak. Um, so uh, certainly uh, when you, if you ask about whether any given uh, literally base pair in the genome is going to be a target, the answer is yes. Uh, and the frequency will be not too far off from, from random, one in a billion, um, but there will be biases. There will be favored regions. And that is really important for the, for the pathology of some of these viruses. We'll talk about that. Okay, so these events, the reverse transcription in the cytoplasm, delivery into the nucleus, and the integration into the host genome are events that take about 12 to 24 hours typically, and they're done. Um, so these are, these are definitely one-shot deals. The DNA is not replicating further. There's no origins of traditional DNA replication. Um, the efficiency of all of this is not fabulous in that it may take typically hundreds of physical particles uh, applied to a cell to have even one uh, successful integration event. Uh, so that's the so-called particle to PFU ratio. And for all mammalian viruses, that number is not great. It's 10, 100, or even 1,000. Um, so you need a lot of particles to do this, and each step is just not perfectly efficient. Um, so the conversion rate from RNA to integrated DNA is, is low. Um, and in fact, it's really hard to apply enough virus ever to a cell, uh, to, a, to a population on a dish, um, to, to get more than one copy per cell. Most of the time, it's below one per cell. Uh, all right, so those are the early events. Those are all the, the really abnormal events that cell are, are cells are doing reactions they don't ever normally do. You don't normally copy RNA to DNA. You don't normally have these bizarre integration events occurring. But once that has happened, now the late steps will typically occur. Um, and an important point is that these are open-ended. So most often, um, an infected cell will now uh, carry out all these late steps for the rest of its life. And for almost all retroviruses, cells are not killed. So cells are simply now uh, converted into producers of virus particles. Um, typically about maybe 1% of the energy of the cell is now committed to production of virus. Maybe 1% of the cellular message will now be viral. Um, but in most cases, cells can handle that. The cells are fine. Um, if you infect a mouse with mouse leukemia virus, huge numbers of cells will become infected in this way and will become producers of virus, and the virus and the animal will be fine. <laughs> it will be viremic. Um, it will mount a vigorous immune response. There will be fantastically high antibody titers, and they will completely fail to clear the virus. Um, the animal will be viremic for life um, and will simply survive with this new fact of life that it has been infected and is uh, having huge numbers of cells that are producing virus at this acceptably uh, low level uh, without immediate bad effects on the host. So what are those steps? The steps are mainly that this new inserted DNA is a template for transcription. Uh, it has a very hot promoter for Paul 2 enough to uh, contribute something like 1% of the message. That's pretty hot for a single gene. Um, and it produces messages. We'll talk about them. Uh, and those messages are exported. Uh, some are spliced. And they give rise to a grand total for the simple viruses of only three proteins. They are GAG, gag Paul, and Envelope. And we'll say more about those. Gag proteins are the guys that build the virus particles that you saw budding in those images at the cell surface. Uh, 
So roughly 1,500 or so of those gag monomers get together um, to build the particle. They package the um, full transcript as the genome. It looks like a message. Uh, it's two per particle. We'll come back to that. The envelope glycoprotein envelope is made separately, delivered through the ER to the cell surface, and then collected at the site of budding by interactions with GAG. Um, the particle is finally assembled, um, pinched off, and released into the extracellular space, and it can begin infection again. The particle as first made is said to be <coughs> immature, um, not infectious yet, and is activated by proteolytic cleavages of the proteins to give rise to an infectious virus. So we'll talk about that. So all these steps occur now more or less continuously. The cell is shedding virus, um, which can spread and infect more cells. Uh, and the cell is, is OK with that and will normally continue its function, whether it's a differentiated cell, whether it, it will keep that function. Uh, it's simply now a producer of virus. Yeah. So are, are these uh, cells in the organism, especially when it's like pickled, just getting reinfected by this? So that's, yeah. So a cell that has become a producer can reinfect itself. Uh, and that does happen uh, briefly. But interestingly, what happens within two or three days is the appearance of the superinfection barrier block. And that is achieved by the fact that an infected cell downregulates the receptor that the virus would like to use to come back and infect itself. Uh, and so it becomes resistant to further infection. And the number of copies, therefore, is frozen at that point. Uh, and the number of copies that is ultimately achieved is, is small, um, usually one or two or five, before that barrier goes up and, and we're done. Such a cell can be reinfected by a virus that uses a different receptor, and then the whole cycle can happen again for that virus. Yeah? yeah. So, so the, the uh, process of assembly is, is stochastic, or somehow the, all the proteins are attracting each other? Because one goes to the membrane, the other has to recreate, and how much kind of infection the virus will Right, so it's an extremely ordered process, certainly not random. The protein, as it's translated, the gag protein is the driver for these um, assembly events, is delivered certainly to the plasma membrane in an orderly transported way. We know a little bit about some of the transport mechanisms, not a lot. Um, they self-aggregate, we know, uh, sideways to each other and, and uh, with appropriate uh, induction of curvature in the membrane. It's just a tricky feature. It has to build a, a sphere uh, out of the planar membrane of the cell. Uh, and then it has to induce the pinching off of the sphere at the end to release it. So all of these are ordered events that are mediated by the gag protein alone. You can actually take constructs that will make just the gag protein and nothing else, and it will shed uh, bald particles into the medium. Uh, and it will package the genome, indeed, even. So this is a pretty amazing protein that does a lot of very fancy things all by itself. All right. So I think those are the main things. Um, the only other thing I should point out is that this integration event uh, and the establishment of the proviral DNA is, is irreversible. It's permanent. It's never going to go away. So the cell that's been infected will carry this uh, forever. And if the cell is a dividing cell, um, it will, of course, now replicate that integration, that integrated DNA, simply as if it were a, a part of its own genome. Uh, it's there forever, and it's there in all the daughter cells forever. Um, and we'll talk about this, the most important fact of, of, of the evolutionary contribution that these guys can make is that they can infect germ cells or early embryos and therefore become integrated into the germline. Um, and as Arnie said, 8% of all your DNA, those of us who declare as human anyway, uh, have um, uh, you know, something like 8% of our genomes are old retroviral infections that have happened uh, in the course of our evolution. And if you broaden the definition to retro elements, it's even much higher, 40% or more. <laughs> so, so these guys are very, very successful uh, parasites. And um, we, we live in the, in the face of their uh, efficient spread. Yeah. So it depends on the species. So uh, mice typically actually have functional integrated copies pretty often. And a lot of mice, therefore, um, 
have inherited copies that are produced, able to produce virus. They're viremic at birth, um, and many wild mice are that way. Um, people, by luck, uh, don't typically have functional herbs. They are old enough uh, in, in evolution that they're mostly defective. So um, we're, we're lucky in that, but uh, actually there are copies of herbs in us that are very, very close to being infectious. They're only two or three mutations away. Uh, these are the uh, most recently acquired copies. And uh, Paul B. Nash and others have cloned out enough of them to correct those and recovered fossil viruses, re reactivated some of the most recent human endogenous retroviruses. <coughs> So, um, you know, the answer is it depends when that last introduction into the germline occurred as to whether or not we happen to carry functional copies or, or only old dead copies. Humans have only old dead copies by, by chance. Yeah? I'm not sure what you mean by germline tumors, but... Yeah, I mean, there's a long history of trying to link retroviruses, herbs, or exogenous to every tumor you could think of. And, and that really reflected the history of these viruses, which were first studied because of their ability to cause leukemias. We'll talk about that. Um, and uh, and there, are, there are people who still believe that they are, there may be causal uh, examples. Um, uh, they're rare, if, if at all. Um, I think most, the, the safest thing is to say for sure many herbs are induced in tumors. So there's expression of uh, endogenous retroviral sequences in a lot of tumors, but whether they're causal is, is unclear. I think most likely not in most cases. There are some, in, uh, we'll, we'll come back. There are many interesting sequelae that come from expression of endogenous retroviruses. Maybe most interesting are the Idea, the ideas of neoantigens being expressed from them. All right, so, so now you've seen the whole life cycle, so we're done. But I want to go back over it in detail again. Yeah? Like, how do we know that how many percent of our DNAs are virals? So purely, purely, purely by sequence gazing. Uh, you mean by sequencing the human genome today and by comparing them with ancient humans? Exactly, yes. So it's, they're pretty easy to see in a lot of ways. There are um, there's, there's still papers being written about the, about the software that is used to recognize them, but the features are straight out similarity to typically Gagpol regions of the retrovirus. Uh, other hallmarks are the repeating sequences at the flanking the genome. Talk about that. So there, these features are pretty easily seen, and, and literally 8% of your DNA is, is pretty obviously retrovirus derived purely based on the sequence. <coughs> yeah. Okay. So, let's, let's now begin again with so the particle. If yeah. there's a really old retrovirus, it could be pretty hard to spot. Say again, say. If there's a really old retrovirus, yes. say sort of, you know, ancestral to us of fish or something, yeah. uh, it could be pretty hard to spot. I think that's totally true, and, it, and the, the debates in the field are at that gray zone. It's like, you know, because they are ancient and decaying simply over time, they eventually reach a point where you don't recognize them anymore. It's totally true. So that number is a minimum, uh, and it, it could be higher, indeed. You're right. All right, so um, the simple retroviruses um, have this kind of arrangement of genes, just three open reading frames, GAG, Paul, and ENV. The GAG protein, as we said, makes up this internal uh, core shell, the Paul uh, gene encodes the replication enzymes which are packaged inside along with it, needed for the early phase of uh, infection, and the envelope gene encodes this glycoprotein on the virion surface. So these are the guys that make up the virus particle. Um, so when they begin infection, the first thing these particles have to do is find their way into the cell. They have to bind to receptors, um, and uh, retroviruses use a wide range of surface molecules as receptors. We probably know more about uh, the retroviral receptors than any other viral family, actually, and they're very diverse. So there's nothing uh, 
particularly uh, uniform about the receptors that these viruses can make use of. Um, so the alpha retroviruses, mostly the avian guys, use uh, some LDL-like molecules, um, interesting receptors like death receptors. Um, MMTV, a mouse mammary tumor virus, uses the transferrin receptor. There are a lot of transporters that are typically used. Gamma retroviruses use an array of amino acid and phosphate transporters. The most famous, many of you know, I'm sure, is HIV uses the T cell marker CD4 and a chemokine uh, co-receptor for entry into its cells. So um, the envelope proteins that mediate the interactions with the receptor um, evolve rapidly uh, in the family and obviously have adapted to use a, a wide, range, wide range of, of cells. Um, some of these are, are, for example, the gamma retrovirus using the mouse ecotropic uh, receptor. This is found on, on virtually all cells. So this virus can infect, bind, and enter almost any cell. Uh, its main restriction in terms of cell type is its need for that cell division that we talked about. So, um, so MLV will typically really only replicate well in cells that are already rapidly dividing, cells like lymphocytes and cells in the gut and a few other places. Post-mitotic cells are not infected well, even if they have receptor. And other viruses, uh, receptors are very restricted. So HIV's receptor is really only found on T cells and a few other cell types. So it's restricted on the basis of the receptor to, to that tissue. All right. So what do envelope proteins do? Um, I think we understand um, best probably really the flu envelope uh, and uh, the retrovirus envelopes are thought to be pretty similar in how they work. Their main function is to mediate the fusion of the bilayers of the virus and the cell. Um, it's, it's a pretty snazzy reaction. Um, there's a lot of uh, of interest in trying to understand how this comes about. Um, it's not very well understood, certainly, um, but we know the rough outlines. So um, most of the viral envelopes are trimers. Um, they typically have two subunits, a, a transmembrane subunit and, a, and an exposed surface subunit. Um, they bind initially to a, a given receptor, and in, in some cases only to one receptor. Um, they insert a very hydrophobic peptide uh, through really very major conformational changes into the target cell. Uh, they bring the two membranes together, and probably some manage to disrupt the continuity um, and allow the membranes to reform uh, in the other arrangements so that their fusion delivers the virus to the cell and everts the particle into the cell. HIV is an interesting, uh, more complicated example in that it binds first to a primary receptor, CD4, and then interacts with a co-receptor, um, triggering further conformational changes that, that finally allow for the fusion to occur. So whatever the receptor the virus has managed to evolve to use, it, it does so. Um, and it delivers the particle into the cell. So the next step is this business of reverse transcription of the viral RNA. So this is what the viral RNA genome looks like. Um, it is a single-stranded sense, positive sense strand RNA. There are two of them <laughs> per, per virion. They are capped polydentylated. Um, a key feature of all retrovirus RNAs in the particle is the presence of a tRNA that is annealed near the five prime end to a specific sequence called the primer binding site. It's a perfect match of 18 bases uh, at the three prime end of the tRNA. And this tRNA was loaded into the particle at the time of assembly. Uh, and it's present within the virion and is ready to go when infection begins. And it serves critically as the point of initiation of reverse transcription. So the enzyme reverse transcriptase, which is also packaged in this particle, is sitting ready to go on the tRNA to start DNA synthesis. Okay. So the enzyme has, um, of course, a checkered history, an interesting history. It uh, was radical in when it was proposed. Um, <coughs> it goes against the central dogma of DNA to RNA to protein. 
Uh, it was the basis of the name retrovirus, um, which came later in the, in the naming of these viruses. Um, but the fact that there was a reverse transcriptase activity um, explained the puzzle at the time of how an RNA virus could possibly make permanent changes in the host genome, uh, like transforming them and causing cancer. Um, and it is, of course, a very, very useful tool that we all make use of all the time in assays of RNA. So the reaction that the enzyme catalyzes is pretty simple here. Um, it needs a primer, uh, like all DNA polymerases. Um, it needs a template. And it will bind to the 3 prime hydroxyl end of a primer and incorporate a triphosphate one at a time um, and, and grow that 3 prime end. So uh, the primer can be either DNA or RNA. Um, what is unique is the template can be either RNA or DNA. Um, and it is only a DNA polymerase. Note, it's not an RNA polymerase. So it only incorporates deoxytriphosphates. Um, it, it's a DNA polymerase that is able to copy either RNA or DNA. And less well known is that it has a second important activity. Uh, reverse transcriptase is also an RNA. It's an RNase H, H for hybrid. Um, and so uh, it has this activity that it can cleave RNA into short oligos, breaking phosphodiester bonds. Um, it only cleaves RNA that's duplex. Um, that RNA can be duplex either as RNA, RNA duplex, or RNA, DNA duplexes. Um, these are endonucleolytic cleavages. Um, and it releases products that are short oligos, typically. Um, that second activity turns out to be uh, totally important for the full process of reverse transcription, which is not a simple reaction, as you'll see. So these two activities turn out to reside in separate domains of this protein. It is a two-domain protein. Um, you can demonstrate that in a variety of ways. But one of the ways is you can take the open reading frame that encodes reverse transcriptase. You can express it, as we did a long time ago, in bacteria and show that the product has both polymer DNA polymerase activity, RNA-SH activity. And you can express portions of the molecule and indeed completely separate those two activities. You can make a fragment which is only a DNA polymerase. And you can make fragments that have only RNA-SH activities. So these are fully separable activities. The real enzyme uh, in the virion particle turns out to have very different structures in different viruses. Uh, and we have no clue really as to why this is true. All these viruses have enzymes with comparable behaviors and activities, but their primary structures are, or secondary structures, tertiary structures are quite different. The Maloney uh, mouse virus is a monomer, and it simply has a polymerase domain and an RNA domain. The avian viruses are heterodimers, um, and they include uh, what looks like a subunit uh, that matches the monomer of the gamma mouse viruses, but they also include a larger subunit that has retained the integrase domain. We'll talk about that. Um, and yet this enzyme works the same as this guy. And HIV is, again, a, a heterodimer, but of a different sort. Um, it has, again, one larger subunit that looks like the monomer of the mouse simple viruses, but it has an additional subunit that's a truncated version lacking the RNA-SH domain. So um, different viruses seem to have built uh, different, different structures, um, but with the same activities. As you could imagine, there's been a lot of structural work done on the HIV reverse transcriptase. It's been crystallized. We know it in, in gory detail. Um, it is two subunits, a 66 kilodalton, a 51 kilodalton subunit. All the critical activities, all the activities, uh, reside in the 66 subunit. Um, it's said to look like a hand, a right hand, with fingers, palm, and thumb. Um, yeah, it's almost true. Uh, and the RNase H is down in the wrist. Um, the 51 subunit is sort of on the back of the hand uh, and is required for good activity, but doesn't contribute any active catalytic uh, functions to the structure of the protein. So we know, we know quite a bit about this structure. Some of the most intense work has come from, uh, from uh, studies of drug resistance, as you might imagine, um, because 
this is a target of many, many HIV uh, drugs. And uh, there's a huge literature of escape mutants uh, in which resistance appears by mutation uh, to a variety of drugs having to do with that fitness that you heard about today. All right. So the reaction that, that RT, that reverse transcriptase, uh, carries out is not a simple reaction. Um, and the first clue that that was true is the fact that the incoming uh, RNA that it begins with, this capped polyvenylated genome, uh, gives rise to a linear double-stranded DNA that's actually longer at both ends than the starting material. So this is not just a simple copy of the RNA. More complicated stuff is going on, and we'll talk about that. Um, features that are critical to the reaction are as follows. There's a repeated element called R at both ends of the RNA, right after the cap and right before the poly A. Um, this is typically 10 to 50 to 100 nucleotides long. Um, there's this sequence called the PBS, the primer binding site, where the tRNA is put. There's a sequence called the PPT, polypurine tract, a little tract of polypurine. Um, and there are these unique elements called U5 and U3, unique 5 prime, unique 3 prime. So this RNA gives rise to a DNA that's bigger, and it's bigger by virtue of duplications that have happened in the course of synthesis. So um, the product has longer repeats at the ends. These are called long terminal repeats, or LTRs. Um, and they're made up of three blocks, U3, RU5, U3, RU5. So what that means is that these single copy unique elements like U5 are duplicated. So there's two copies in the end, two copies of U3. And both of those um, copies arise by something called jumps, or translocations of sequences during reverse transcription. So um, I think everybody should have seen the next slide once. You don't have to memorize it unless you're a real retrovirologist. But you should know that there, uh, you should know that there is an understanding, at least, of how we go from a single-strand RNA to the double-stranded RNA at the bottom that's longer than the starting material. The trick is that DNA synthesis begins with this tRNA and makes a short molecule called minus strand strong stop DNA. And the trick is that this DNA jumps to the other end of the genome. And that jump, if you sort of think about it, is pushing a copy of U5 out beyond the end of the RNA. So you now have a, a chunk of U5 down here at this end. It's going to end up at the end um, beyond the, the starting point of the RNA. Um, for the second strand, the same kind of thing happens. You again start with a little element of RNA. You make, a strong, you make a strong stop DNA molecule. It too jumps. It jumps through a circular intermediate. But the net effect is a jump of a translocation of this to this end. And that, again, effectively pushes out a U3 copy beyond the edge of the RNA. So the important thing is that these two jumps push sequences out. They build a longer DNA molecule with a bigger repeat. Uh, and it extends so that it more than encompasses the region required to make the RNA again. And that's important because this proviral DNA that we're going to form has to serve as the template to make more RNAs again. And these, these, these elements that are extended out beyond the RNA provide sequences that are needed for the directing the transcription of the RNA. So there's a hot promoter here. There are signals for polyadenylation down here. So there's a, there's a beauty to this system that you can go from, a, from an RNA in the virion particle. You can build this larger DNA, and it's perfectly arranged to be self-contained in a way and to be able to give rise to more RNA in the next round, independent of where, more or less, independent of where it integrates. It doesn't require any sequences outside of itself. It's not dependent on them for the formation of more RNA copies. What makes these jumps sufficient is the volume is very small and the nucleotide concentration, therefore, is very high. So that's a very, uh, part, part of that's very important. Uh, that is true that the reaction that is catalyzing this, all this is happening in a 
sort of virion particle in the cytoplasm of the infected cell in a small volume. So these, these, uh, all these things are very well concentrated in a small volume. And indeed, if you can amazingly run this whole reaction with purified virus particles in a test tube with no cell if you just give them triphosphates. So you can take virion particles that run the so-called endogenous reaction. If you give very high triphosphates, the enzyme in the virion particle will do this whole job to this final double strand point. Um, interestingly, the levels of triphosphates in the cell are rather limiting, in fact, uh, in the cytoplasm. Triphosphate levels are fairly low. Uh, and uh, nucleoside, triphosphate nucleoside triphosphates, nucleotides, are low in the, in the cytoplasm. And this, is a, this turns out to be a point of, of, uh, of importance because um, there is a, a factor in cells that uh, will, will limit the concentration further, and that can occur sufficiently to prevent infection. You can actually block reverse transcription by starving the virus of triphosphates. Uh, SAMHD1 is that <coughs> enzyme, and it's, it's such an important mechanism of resistance that uh, viruses have evolved their own genes to eliminate SAMHD1 to elevate the triphosphate levels back up to a usable uh, level for the virus. So, so triphosphates in the cytoplasm are in short supply, and it is a limiting problem for viruses to get enough to do this reaction. So another question that should have been in many of your minds is why are there two copies of that RNA in the virion particle? Why are they diploid? Um, that whole scheme, you may notice, all seems to be happening just fine with a single copy of RNA. And indeed, it is true that a single RNA molecule should be sufficient to uh, do reverse transcription. But the fact is there are two particles, two RNAs in the particle. Um, and it, it, when, you, when we uh, think about it after the fact, we realize that it gives some incredibly uh, useful advantages to the viruses. Um, one is that uh, it allows for recombination. Um, so anytime a cell is co-infected by two viruses and those two RNAs are packaged into the particles uh, and that particle then infects the cell and does reverse transcription, uh, there will be an enormously high frequency of recombination because reverse transcription can switch from one molecule to the other. RT does that very efficiently. Um, it's so efficient that in a typical infection, it, it happens more than once, usually, per transit down the genome. So um, almost all reverse transcription products are recombinants. Uh, normally, in a simple infection, the two are identical, so there's no effect. But if they differ uh, in any way, recombinants will appear. Um, maybe more importantly, it allows the virus to deal with breaks. So uh, the genomes can be broken. And in fact, many of the RNAs in virion particles are broken. These are large molecules. They're 10 kb. Um, RNA is very fragile. Um, they can be broken in lots of different ways. Um, they can be broken by radiation, they can be broken by pH, they can be broken. Uh, it turns out retrovirus particles are quite resistant to breakage, and they can continue a normal infection even when the RNAs are quite damaged. And that's because when the reverse transcriptase hits a break, it simply transits over to the other copy, continues, maybe it'll hit another break, go back, and finish. Eventually, it will complete a full-length DNA. So there's both the advantages that recombination gives you and the resistance to damage that it gives you. Is this the only diploid virus? Um, I should ask Tom, can we think of any others? I don't think of any. No. <laughs> you know, we're used to segmented viruses, but again, single copy of each segment. Um, I think that's true. You just, you just gave maybe the rationale for why they're diploid. I mean, yeah. Yeah. You know, DNA viruses probably don't have the, the, the damage situation in a severe way, but um, other RNA viruses that have very large genomes, you know, tend to have very low uh, 
uh, tighter and low and very high particle to PFU ratios because of that difficulty. All right. So, yeah. Yeah, um, so there's a, that's a good question. We don't really know uh, if ever there's more than two. So we'll talk a bit about that if we get to packaging of the genome. Um, so the, there's a very ordered structure in the dimers that is the target of the packaging event. Uh, it's possible you could have two dimers uh, within one particle. Uh, this may happen. Um, there isn't anything obviously bad about that. Um, that could happen. You could deliver more than one genome that way. But I think the norm, anyway, is probably a single dimer per particle. <coughs> All right. So, um, so we've, we've done reverse transcription in the cytoplasm. We've made this linear double-stranded DNA with these two LTRs, these long terminal repeats, longer typically than the input RNA. And the next species that appear are those shown here. So there are these circular forms these dead-end products that are signs of failure uh, to integrate. Uh, and their structures are here. So the circle with one LTR arises through homologous recombination between these two direct repeats. Uh, that's, that's one event that cells use to repair uh, broken ends. And the other is just the ligation of the ends together, which gives you a two LTR circle. Um, but the, the important product is the integrated provirus which is joined quite precisely at the tips of the linear DNA uh, at, at, as we said, roughly random uh, points in the cell genome. Did hepatitis B, there are circular forms, but I thought they were intermediates before integration rather than failures. So that's, that's right. So the CCC DNA of, of, uh, of the hepatitis virus is, is uh, the major intermediate. They don't integrate efficiently. There's rare integration events. So the circular molecules are the templates for forward transcription. Um, so there is a circular form, you'll note here, as an intermediate during reverse transcription. Uh, and this is the analog of what Hep B does to make its circles. So if you complete synthesis of this strand and then ligate all the breaks, you will end up with a CCC that's effectively a one LTR circle. And that's essentially what Hep B does. Um, in contrast, the retroviruses displace the, the strand and open the circle back up to the linear. So um, some of the circles that you see here are of that sort, that are, but the majority are formed post-reverse transcription from the linear. And um, the distinguishing feature is that the circles that form during reverse transcription are happening in the cytoplasm. The things here happen all in the nucleus. All right, so the next step is that integration step. Um, so this reaction is catalyzed by a real enzyme, the integrase, which, like reverse transcriptase, comes in to the cell in the virion particle. Um, it recognizes specific sequences at the tips of the viral DNA um, and chooses its target uh, and integrates that DNA. So the product. Um, will be a full-length copy of the linear DNA. Um, exactly two base pairs are lost at the tips. Uh, the sequences are almost always CA, TT, CTA, CA something something. CA is a super conserved aspect. And the CA is the site of joining to the cell DNA. Two base pairs are lost at each end. Um, and, and there's a duplication of a small number of bases at the target site which then flank the integrated provirus. So these are, again, features diagnostic of all those integrated copies of ERVs in our genomes. Um, clean insertion, duplicated bases uh, at, the, at, the, at the, um, the virgin site uh, and, uh, and perfect joining to those sites. And once that has happened, this is now the template for the transcription uh, of the progeny RNA. So the reaction really has two steps. There's uh, this is another version of that same reaction. Here's the linear DNA. The ends are indeed held together by the integrase. Um, the integrase is, I'll show you in a minute, at least a tetramer, maybe in some cases even an octamer. Uh, 
Um, it holds the ends together non-covalently. Uh, and then they are activated, the ends are, are activated by an uh, endonucleolytic cleavage at the CA, which produces 3' prime hydroxyls. And those 3' prime hydroxyls are used in a nucleophilic attack on the target DNA in a staggered way. Um, and the stagger is determined by the particular integrase to be either four, five, or six bases apart. We know viruses of all those sorts. Um, and when one strand and only one strand at each end is joined, um, the DNA opens up uh, and you're left with a gap and an unclosed strand. Uh, integrase leaves it that way and leaves it to the cell to repair that. Uh, and it does quickly do so because that's not a very difficult damage for the cell to repair. It's just another version of the same reaction. Um, again, uh, you have this, this coordinated attack on the target DNA, staggered, uh, joining one strand, opening up, and leaving the cell to then repair uh, those gaps. <coughs> so um, the integrase of HIV, and uh, again, has been the subject of intense study, as you might imagine. Um, this is a great target of drugs. Uh, some of the very best uh, AIDS drugs are integrase inhibitors, uh, and so of course, uh, <laughs> effort has been made into understanding the structure. And again, resistance mutations are, are uh, understood in these cases too. So uh, this is uh, a, an integrase of another, another virus, not HIV, but uh, the, the details are very similar. There's a binding site for the target DNA. There's the binding site for the two ends of the viral DNA. Uh, and the business end is occurring at the center where the uh, there is both the cleavage of the um, three prime end of the uh, viral DNA and the transfer of those to the target DNA. And it's an isoenergetic reaction, so there is, requires no ATP. Um, it's just an exchange and, uh, and a release of the products. All right, so that's the establishment of the proviral DNA. And as I say, it, it's never going to go away from the cell. Um, it is simply now able to be transcribed um, to give rise to progeny RNA and progeny virus. So uh, it is the duplicated LTRs that now provide the signals for those subsequent events. Uh, most important is that the U3 region is essentially a promoter uh, and it's an enhancer for transcription which begins right at the U3R edge generating that, that genome, a full-length unspliced transcript. And there are sites for polyvanillation down at this end. And the U3 regions of retroviruses are some of the most rapidly evolving uh, parts of the genome. Um, many viruses have essentially acquired uh, binding sites for every trans positive transcription factor in the world that we know of. So these viruses are all purpose, and they will be able to um, be expressed well at fairly high levels in any cell type they find themselves in. Other viruses have evolved more, more cell type specific promoters, and they will only give rise to high levels of progeny in particular cell types. So um, MMTV, the mouse mammary tumor virus, is only well expressed in cells with glucocorticoid receptor because its enhancer elements require glucocorticoid receptor. Maloney is, a, is a, one of these ubiquitously expressed guys. It has binding sites for everything. So no matter, almost, no matter what kind of cell type it finds itself in, it's going to be able to be well expressed. Um, so enormous amounts of effort have been invested in understanding the binding sites. Really, these promoters are models uh, for, trans for promoters of the cell. So. Um, Understanding all of the factors that work on retrovirus have really been uh, sort of primary to understanding how these factors work on cell genes. Yeah. Uh, sort of related to the previous part, like how is the choice of where to insert the, retro, the retroviral genome like random, or like is it does it like choose certain regions? Well, so. so so we talked a little about that. So it's close to random, but as I said, different viruses do have biases, have preferences. So 
simplest is Maloney virus likes to go into five prime ends of genes, typically. Um, but its insertion there um, doesn't necessarily involve the, the signals of that gene. It's self-contained. But it's probably by inserting into an area of active open chromatin, it's going to be able to be expressed better. Uh, that's presumably the basis for that preference. The mechanism of the choice we understand a little. It's determined by the integrase. And the integrase has surfaces of interaction with particular proteins that are sitting uh, on the five prime ends of genes. So um, different viruses integrases uh, determine that. And you can document that by swapping the integrases and swap the preference of integration site um, by a given virus. So um, HIV binds to LEGF, which is a transcription factor. Uh, Maloney binds to BARDS 2 and 4, which are BET proteins, so on. So different viruses have evolved interactions, just as they've evolved different envelopes to use different receptors. On the cell surface, they've evolved different integrases that target their integration to different sites. You, I was just going to say, we might want to point out, because I Transcription factors have only been introduced generically. So SP1, NF kappa B, USF, and BAT, AP1, COO. They're all this different names of different transcription factors, and they're distinguished by binding to different DNA sequences. Right. So each of these has quite short elements where they bind. Uh, and the U3 region of most retrovirus is just literally wall-to-wall -wall binding sites fa for factor after factor. Um, no I can't remember. Tada is the promoter. Yes. So all the transcription factors are binding at the enhancer, and Tada is the promoter. Right. So Tada uh, is essentially a binding site for the for a protein that really registers the start site very very relatively precisely. Um, so the start point is is pretty pretty uh, precisely determined by that. Uh, to be, I forget, is it 27 or 9 bases downstream? Um, and, and, and starts. Um, yeah, there's, a, there's, there's some whole interesting things about uh, the exact start point, um, but we can talk about that maybe at, at 6 or whenever later. All right. So, um, so as I've said, these, these, this multiplicity of factors means that. Um, the viruses will typically start being expressed right away, no matter what cell type they're in. Um, and, and that is the rule, but there are exceptions. So there are important cases where the integrated provirus is not expressed, but is silent. Um, and that has some important biology. Um, the mouse leukemia viruses, for example, are, and others now, are well understood to be silenced heavily in certain cell types, in embryonic cells. So that includes embryonic stem cells, true embryonic cells, uh, even hematopoietic stem cells, other developmentally primitive cells, and the, the famous induced uh, pluripotent cells. So in these cells, infection occurs, proviruses are established, and they're silenced. So there's no subsequent spread of virus. Uh, and presumably, that's a protective step uh, to prevent virus from spreading in those important cell types. The, the other extremely important or annoying uh, setting is with HIV uh, in a number of, of T cells, a minority uh, by far, but there are cells that become infected and uh, where the provirus is, is not expressed. Uh, and um, because the provirus never goes away uh, and because those cells can have a lifetime of decades, um, the virus can hide in the form of an integrated provirus is a latent infection uh, forever, essentially. So at later times, that uh, integrated provirus, if it's not defective in any way, uh, can be reactivated and start up the infection again. So this is a problem because when you are treated effectively with drugs to prevent spread, um, after 20 years, uh, the virus seems to be gone. But as soon as you stop the drugs, uh, one Literally one copy uh, is enough to start up the infection again. Yeah. Uh, is, is this silencing through epigenetic mechanisms in these different cell types? Yeah, it is. Um, so what we know about it is that it's certainly histone-based. 
um, involving uh, modifications to histones that silence the chromatin up and down. Um, we work on this in my lab. Uh, we work especially on, on this setting. Um, and we know a lot of the factors that are specific to embryonic cells that do the silencing. It's a dominant machinery that, that shuts down transcription. Um, one of the, the sort of level of understanding at the moment is here. Um, these are some of the factors in mouse embryonic cells uh, that, that are responsible. Um, they act through specific sequence elements on the virus. Uh, they target those sequences to bring a very large complex of proteins, uh, whose, some of whose functions we know, uh, to do the silencing. These include histone modifiers that uh, do histone methylation and, and deacetylation uh, to keep the provirus quiet. They target interesting elements on the virus. They, one of them targets the primer binding site, which is sort of a brilliant thing to target because the virus can't escape by mutating that site. Um, it needs that site. <laughs> and so mouse cells have evolved a factor that targets that and, and shuts down the virus in a way that it can't easily um, escape. All right. Um, so many viruses, transcription is constitutive and at a pretty high level. But uh, some uh, transcription is, is regulated, profoundly regulated. Um, and HIV is a good example, where um, HIV, in fact, encodes a transactivator protein that uh, hugely amplifies the level of expression from its own uh, uh, proviruses. So it's a really interesting protein. It's a short, very small, basic protein. Um, and its mode of action is interesting in that it doesn't bind DNA to bring uh, polymerase to the job. It actually binds RNA. So it binds to the very short initial transcript uh, and then brings factors to uh, promote uh, elongation of any transcripts that have already been begun. Um, and it's a really profound factor. It will increase the formation of messages hundreds of fold. Um, it's a very potent transactivator. Um, it's an interesting uh, evolutionary fact that it works in humans. It's one of the most uh, human specific aspect of HIV. HIV's TAT function only really works in human cells with the protein called cyclin T. Um, and people working very hard to make mouse models of HIV um, immediately ran into the fact that the HIV TAT does not work in mouse cells. Yeah. <laughs> sure. No, you had a question there. <laughs> uh, so, does that mean that most transcripts end up being aborted without? Yeah, they pause and, and sit. Um, and that's, so that's right. There's a huge accumulation of short guys sitting there waiting, and they will only be elongated with TAT. But of course, normally there is TAT, and uh, it, it normally works to crank out lots of RNA. And is that true of, of post RNA, too? That a lot of transcripts are. There, yeah, there, there, are, there are settings with pauses like this. There's, there's not, I think, any potent host uh, release factor like this known yet in eukaryotes, but it's not unheard of for initiation not to be the limiting, but elongation released from initiation to be uh, a limiting regulatory site. Yeah. yeah. What about the uh, evolution of this, uh, of HIV, say, in primates? I mean, you say compatible with humor. What about chimps? Oh, yeah. So the, the, I mean, HIV is a chimp virus, yeah. basically. So, so uh, all the lengthy. Does, excuse, does, the human form of H, does the human form of HIV actually infect chimps? Is it uh, pathogenic in chimps? Uh, yes. And, and the, the CPZ uh, virus is pathogenic in chimps. They get AIDS. Um, and and uh, it it's, uh, takes 10 years, as it does in humans. Yeah. So it was missed for a long time. But yes, they get AIDS. And it's, a, it's enough of an epidemic. People are, again, worried about it in chimps. Yeah. There are some of the primates in which it's not pathogenic, right? Well, the SIVs, uh, now much larger family, um, many of them are not very pathogenic, indeed. Yes. They, but they're older, and they are the precursors of HIV. Yes. I mean, if you go back far enough, yes. So a, the SIVs that are studied the most are the precursors of HIV2. So this brings up that uh, generalization is worth, 
that is the zoonotic, which Paul introduced this morning. The zoonotic viruses, after many, many generations, viruses tend to attenuate in their hosts and not be very pathogenic because it's better for sure. them not to be pathogenic in their hosts. Right. So that, that this jumps to chimp and then jumps to humans are what probably makes these very pathogenic. And if we Briefly, now, maybe they'll, they'll, they'll viruses, yeah. which will be less I think that's right. So uh, I agree. The mouse leukemia viruses have have reached a, a peace, if you will, with their host, and um, they're they're very successful. They're widespread. If you catch the mice out here, they'll probably have MLV, but they're they're tolerated, and and that's a very effective lifestyle. You know, I think different viruses make that choice. I mean, Ebola is a slash and burn. Uh, kind of virus. It's not, it didn't choose that route. It's, it's taken another route. But both not of those can be very successful. Not in, not in bats, indeed. Yeah, right. I mean, True. The, the most wonderful experiment is this one where the a virus was introduced into to kill rabbits in Australia. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. So, so that was a human introduction to try to try to restrict the rabbit population. It worked briefly. <laughs> <laughs> right. So it worked briefly. The rabbit population did diminish, and then they came back because they immediately developed resistance and, and, well, and came back. Resistance, but the virus <laughs> away, yeah, yeah. So, um, so this, is, this is the way to think about evolution for sure is, uh, you know, the virus is, is doing whatever it, it needs to do or will do to promote its spread, to increase its, its fitness. And fitness may involve uh, super high titer rapid replication, or it may do better with latency and slow growth and lack of pathogenicity. Both of those can work um, to the benefit of the virus. All right. So, um, so that's TAT. I'll say a little bit more about its mode of action. TAT is known to bind to a very uh, uh, well-defined structure, the so-called TAR element. It's right at the cap of HIV. That's the cap, 5' end. Uh, and this, this hairpin-like structure is, this, is the site of binding. Um, it brings with it a huge complex of cellular proteins um, that actually do the work. I, I don't, we don't need to worry about them here. But this, this little nascent RNA is the guy bound by, by this TAR element, is the guy bound by TAT, which then brings the rest of these to the table ultimately allowing Paul II to release and go down the rest of the way down the genome. All right. So the only other thing I want to say about expression <laughs> um, has to do with some curious features of, uh, of, of the handling of the RNA after transcription. Um, first thing is that all the retroviruses make uh, two, at least two classes of RNAs. They make a full-length transcript from end to end. Uh, and that's going to be the genome, of course. So that's going to be what's packaged as the dimer to transfer to the new progeny. That transcript is also used to make the GAG and Paul proteins. And they're made, um, as is shown by the red lines here, uh, in the case of the simple viruses, to give rise to two GAGs. They, they are different by their starting points for translation. Um, they're identical in the region of overlap. And like a well-behaved protein, they end with a stop codon. Um, but in addition to those proteins made from this single RNA, there are also two gag Paul proteins, and they're made as fusions of gag to Paul. That's the only way the Paul protein is expressed. Uh, and these proteins, uh, one gag, one gag Paul, uh, are the guys that get together to build the progeny virus. There's in addition a spliced RNA, which is the guy used to make envelope. Um, and so this spliced RNA has a new start site and makes this single uh, envelope protein. These are all precursor proteins. Um, they're all assembled, and then they're processed to give rise to the mature virus that's in the mature proteins that are in the final active um, virion particle. So there's some weird things going on here. There's um, alternate starts for translation. Um, this is a little odd. It's not unheard of in eukaryotic genes. Um, only one of them is an AUG start. The other is an abnormal uh, CUG start. That happens. Um, the most curious thing is the misreading of the stop codon to give rise to these larger proteins. Um, 
these two happen about 95, 90 maybe percent of the time. These guys happen 5 or 10 percent of the time. Uh, and the ratio between them is, turns out to be critical. Uh, and it's a point of regulation by the virus to do this aberrant business of not necessarily stopping at a stop codon. We'll talk about that. Um, the splicing is also unusual in that you, you have about half and half unspliced and half spliced. Normally you think of transcripts being fully spliced, but retroviruses have set it up with inefficient splicing so that you have both full length and spliced formed at about equal levels. And this is the simple viruses. The more complex guys like HIV have way more complicated splicing patterns with actually as many as 100 alternate splices formed in appropriate ratios to give rise to not just the envelope, but a variety of these little added proteins that have evolved to be inserted, tucked into different corners of the genome. So how does this, how does this misreading of the stop codon work? Even this turns out to be not uniformly handled by different viruses. There are two completely parallel mechanisms by which this is done. Um, the more famous is frame shifting. So um, retrovirus, many, many retrovirus genomes have built in the ability to make a GAG protein and a GAG pol by how? By frame shifting translation before they hit the stop codon out of uh, frame into a different reading frame that now passes through the stop codon out of frame. So it's not read, of course, as a stop codon, but read as parts of two codons. Um, and the fusion is, is formed in that way. The frame shift is induced by structures in the RNA that include a, a highly ordered pseudonaut and a slippery site where the ribosome is induced to slip back one base and now continue on. And that happens, as I say, about 10 percent of the time that translation passes through here. So this is an interesting, odd feature that actually is a, is a subject of uh, uh, attempts to find inhibitors that would screw this up. There are a few cellular genes that do this, not too many. Other viruses have evolved a completely different mechanism to get to the same result. Um, in these viruses, the GAG and the PAL are not in different reading frames. They're in the same reading frame. And instead, translation is simply induced to pass right through the stop codon and to misread it, not as a stop, but as a glutamine. Um, and uh, there are, again, structures in the RNA that are somehow telling the ribosome to make this error uh, at about 10 percent of the time. Um, and again, the virus needs that to happen. Uh, and if, you, if it under happens or over happens, uh, either thing is bad from the point of view of the virus. And again, there's a few cellular genes that, that turn out to do this. So it's, it's, um, it's not unheard of, but uncommon. All right. So um, I told you these were precursor proteins, and they are. So they, they are made as a single uh, translated product or two, uh, and when the virus is assembled, uh, they are then processed. They turn out to be processed by a viral protease, which is one of these guys themselves, this guy right here. Um, so this guy is a protease. It activates, cleaves up GAG, cleaves itself, which is probably tricky, um, and a cellular protein cleaves uh, uh, the envelope protein in the ER. Um, so in the end, the virus is made up of all these much smaller proteins um, that have been chopped up out of that precursor. And that's a very common feature seen in polio and in lots of viral proteins um, or lots of settings. It's easiest for the virus to make a precursor and then chop it up than to make separate proteins. But it requires the folding of the protein properly. And right. The protease, in fact, that's active is a dimer. So uh, it requires that it dimerize, probably in the context of the huge precursor. Uh, and then becomes active and cuts its own uh, 5 prime and 3 uh, N terminus and C terminus, and releasing the protease that then chops everybody else up. Which is more part of the self assembly process. Yeah, and the timing of that is important. So we don't, we don't uh, understand really the timing of activation of the protease, but it, it clearly has to happen uh, not too early and not too late. It has to happen after the virus is largely assembled. Um, but it has to happen to activate the virus to become infectious. All right. So on that point, this is 
This is, a, again, a, an area of intense study. Um, this is probably the, uh, the, real, the, the true fact of what we understand and the, the level of resolution of what we really understand about immature virus assembly, which is just gag proteins getting together through sideways interactions, incorporating gag pols at their abundance, which is about 10%, uh, and attracting the envelope through interactions through the membrane uh, between envelope and gag. Um, inducing curvature, which is tricky, uh, and then finally forming a sphere um, and releasing it. Now we know there's a lot of cellular proteins that help. Um, and the major proteins that are studied are the so-called escort proteins. Um, so these were first known in, in yeast as as vesicular trafficking membrane uh, uh, fusion guys. So I, I don't, I don't want to belabor all of them, but to say that there are, are really many, many cellular proteins that are working um, with GAG to, uh, to, to build the membrane uh, curvature and to especially pinch off the membrane at the end and release the, the virion particle. Um, and most of these are um, recruited to the site of budding by particular short sequences on GAG, um, which are the binding sites for the various of the escort proteins. So that's, the, that's a uh, linear <laughs> uh, depiction of GAG with its binding sites. So mutations of these sites uh, in GAG um, often have strong phenotypes where the particle is, is stuck at, at states like this where it can't be released because it fails to bring the appropriate escort protein to do the job uh, of releasing it. So um, after the particle is built out of the precursor, after the genome is incorporated, uh, cleavage then uh, activates a big conformational change. The mature virus looks different from the immature uh, in that the core is, is more condensed. Um, it's really a complete rebuilding of the particle. Um, because actually only about half the gag proteins that are in the immature are, are used to make the mature. Uh, there's a lot of extra gag left unused. Um, and uh, this, this core has a, a much more defined structure than this, this sort of lipid-like uh, protein in the immature. In the case of HIV, again, structural studies have, uh, have been pushed and we understand it's a hexagonal uh, grid of gag of capsid proteins that make up this, this conical core. They're mainly hexamers, and the judicious placement of pentamers, five mers, uh, is responsible for this conical shape. There's five here and seven here, uh, giving an asymmetric uh, shape to the core. And we have no clue why it has to be that way or why it is that way. Other viruses have the pentamers distributed more uniformly so that the core is a sphere um, or symmetrically into a cylinder. Yeah? What drives genome incorporation? Go back to previous slide. Right. So the next question is, what drives the genome <laughs> incorporation? Um, and what we know really are the structures of the RNA uh, and a little bit about the portion of GAG that binds it. So the very C-terminal part of GAG is a domain called NC for nucleocapsid. It's a zinc finger containing short motif. Um, it's the RNA binding activity of GAG. Um, and it has selective affinity for this structure at the phi prime end of the viral RNA. So um, the structure that has got the high, highest affinity um, is a dimer structure, um, presumably why or how that we get two genomes. Um, it has a lot of nonspecific RNA binding activity too, um, but presumably this has got enough uh, higher specific uh, affinity to become the major RNA in the virion particle. Although it's worth saying that a lot of RNA in the virion particle is not viral. There's a lot of cellular RNAs, maybe 10, maybe 30 percent of the RNA in the virion particle is not the viral genome but is a gamish of cellular RNAs that are incorporated nonspecifically. Um, they have the potential to have function, um, but we wouldn't know much about that. Um, but it's a fact of life that there's quite a lot of junk <laughs> RNA in the virion particle that's, that's not viral. Yeah. Uh, 
so so no so these these incorporated RNAs are typically not reverse transcribed. So in the next infection, they're just delivered to the cell, and they may be translated. They may be uh, functional in that sense briefly, but they're not genetically inherited because they don't have all the features required for proper reverse transcription. So we'll, 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 yes, we will come to that quickly. And it's true that they can, through recombination, acquire viral uh, cellular messages in, a, in patches onto the viral genome, actually. So yeah. Um, so, so a bit. So is it that the capsid cannot reorganize until the particle has left the cell? Yes. I mean, the protease is not activated to cleave gag to condense the core until it's left the cell. Um, so this prevents reinfection. Right. So the, the virus cannot reinfect the same cell until it's been released and then rebound to receptor again, right? So retro elements, of course, uh, don't have this problem. They actually can uh, undergo reverse transcription within the cell that made them. Their reverse transcription can be activated without, and is typically activated, without them ever leaving the cell. So they reintegrate back into their own genome, again, without the need for all these events. Yes, it can amplify its ccDNA, indeed, right within the same cell again and again. Yep, true. So we know a little about the RNA, and this is from work of, of Mike Summers and others, most of it by NMR. Um, and it's, it's, this is a tough problem because RNA structures are dynamic. Um, uh, these are large structures for, for structure work to be done on, uh, typically 100 or 200 uh, uh, nucleotides long. Um, what is interesting is that there's clearly an equilibrium between two states, uh, a state that we think is promoting the translation uh, and making, using this RNA as a message to make GAG and gag Paul and a state that's more prone to packaging as the genome. Um, they are probably in equilibrium between each other. Um, so there's some kind of choice made by the pool of RNA in the cell to either be genome or to be message. Uh, um, until quite recently, this was assumed to be identical in, in sequence. Recently, it's been found that these have a, maybe a tendency to differ by that one base pair at the five prime end. And that depending on the exact start point of transcription, uh, the product RNA will be tending to be packaged or used as message one way or the other. And it's not a perfect uh, switch, but it's significant uh, bias toward one pathway or the other. And the idea, I think, is that notice these are, these are not, uh, you know, complementary, these are identical in sequence. So the pairing is not simple, and the pairing is in little patches only, um, uh, and, uh, and, and very variable in, in organization. In one dimer structure, uh, there is a small element that is probably the highest affinity binding site for GAG and represents the packaging signal. That sequence is buried in the structure for the message, so tending to make that less packageable. Um, so uh, I think this is an interesting model of, of RNA structure function. I think a lot of RNAs uh, will behave this way in having alternate conformations that determine alternate functions uh, later in life. OK, so I think we've done the whole life cycle again. Um, We've gone from particle back to particle again. Um, I probably have no time, right? But um, we'll have a little time uh, after. okay, so I'll just go until, until you stop at me, and uh, and we'll pick it up again later. I think it's worth saying a little bit about the pathogenesis uh, uh, capability of these viruses. So uh, I said that these are very benign, and that that we tolerate them, and that's generally true. But they do cause cancer. They are. They do bad things. Um, uh, typically, uh, leukemias uh, will arise in an uh, infected mouse after a period of months, many months. 
uh, where they've been viremic for a long, long time. Uh, and that turns out to occur through insertional activation in the main. That is, uh, after literally millions of cells have suffered an insertion, uh, by bad luck, finally, one of those insertion events will be in a bad place for the cell. And uh, those are of two sorts. They are of direct promoter insertion, that is transcriptional promoters of the virus are in a bad place, or enhancers uh, are in a bad place. And uh, we'll talk about that quickly. And then uh, the other mechanism is the one asked a minute ago, which is the transduction, that is the actual acquisition of cellular sequences onto the viral genome. Oh, good. And I can say very little about it then. Good. I mean, good. Say something because it's always good to hear it twice. Yes. Okay. Good. So the um, the fact is, you should think of these as mutagens. It's appropriate to think of retroviruses as mutagens because every infection creates a mutation. It creates a special kind of mutation, which is an insertion, um, which has the potential to be pretty profound. So most infections are in insertions are harmless. Uh, they they simply turn the cell into a producer of virus, but they don't do anything bad at the site of insertion. But occasionally, the insertion rarely can happen at a bad spot next to a critical gene whose expression is now affected and where the consequences can be serious on the cell. And um, as I say, there are two sorts. There's the um, notion of inserting a promoter. The viral LTR, here's, an, here's a provirus that's been inserted. The LTR is a hot promoter. It's going to start transcription. That transcription can run, is intended to run from virus LTR to LTR, but it can keep going and it can therefore affect genes further away. Um, it's especially prone to do that if the provirus suffers deletions. For example, if you delete the right LTR, now the remaining LTR will, of course, run into the uh, downstream. And if you delete the upstream LTR, the downstream LTR will become hyperactivated and, again, will run down downstream. So with or without deletion, uh, the promoter insertion will drive often downstream expression. Um, even more generally, the mere insertion of the provirus anywhere can have effects at considerable distances because enhancers can work at considerable distances. So an enhancer uh, can activate promoters 10 kb, hundreds of kb even, away and give rise to um, abnormally high levels of transcription. That can happen whether the insertion is upstream or downstream even of the gene because enhancers work in both directions uh, and uh, will drive inappropriate expression of lots of genes nearby. So if this gene is a, is a proto-oncogene whose levels are important, uh, bad things can happen from overexpressing it. These insertions that insert promoters uh, can also give rise to quite aberrant products because you can often make transcripts that include only part of a gene, um, either the first part or the second part, and make fragments of proteins. Uh, and those can have dominant effects and they can have bad effects on the cell. So, Okay, we're good. I can make I can make two or three points. Um, one of the hot genes for um, the mouse leukemia viruses is the MYC gene. So um, most of the oncogenes actually that we know about um, were identified in this way as sites of insertion of retroviruses in tumors. Um, most of them are named, in fact, for the virus. Uh, but anyway, MYC uh, has been studied intensively because if you infect 100 mice, uh, then six months later, uh, 100 of them will get leukemia. And uh, each one of them will have now suffered an insertion at an important gene. Um, and the vast majority of those will turn out to be MYC. Um, and so each of these triangles represents a mouse <laughs> who got leukemia due to an insertion somewhere in the MYC gene. Um, they are mostly pointing with the gene. Uh, most of these insertions are activating expression of MYC exons 2 and 3, which are the coding exons. Some even are backwards, and they still activate MYC. Um, so uh, it's quite uh, actually uh, 
of accessible to generate large numbers of insertions um, simply by picking tumors um, and looking at, at where the insertion has occurred. Okay, so I won't talk about transduction because Arnie's going to talk about it, but um, it is a fact that insertions can produce transcripts that are packaged. Um, even unadulterated transcripts can be packaged, but these fusion transcripts are really well packaged. And once they are packaged, um, recombination through that process of reverse transcription that we talked about um, can embed them basically within the retroviral genome. And once that, those recombination events have happened, um, the product is a genome that's a, a retroviral genome with a, with a cellular gene embedded and now requires no fancy business to be further transmitted. Now it has the termini, it has all the sequences appropriate for reverse transcription and integration. This new genome is a transducing genome for the cellular gene um, and is carried by the virus, can be carried by the virus as a dimer as a heterodimer even with the wild type genome. So um, many, many transforming genomes have been generated and studied uh, as essentially partners uh, tr being transmitted along with the parent helper virus um, and causing cancers through the uh, delivery of the oncogene to recipient cells. So um, this is how they're transmitted. These are just some examples Arnie may talk about, but in, this is by, by no means a complete list of all the many, many oncogenes that have been transduced um, by different retroviruses, a, avian, mouse, others. Um, so this is a very frequent mechanism um, by which these viruses cause cancers. No. <laughs> and that's, uh, you know, a consequence that we don't have a lot of uh, viruses running around in us by luck. HIV, you know, has is, is been raised as an issue whether it could. Um, HIV is unusual in, the, in that it really uh, kills the majority of the cells it infects. Very unusual for retroviruses to do that. But it uh, doesn't transduce but very HIV often. The LD1 is one example of a retrovirus that chronically gives rise to infection. So HDLV1 is yet a different mechanism of transformation. Um, it carries oncogenes of its own. Um, they are two, TACs and HBZ, the so-called. Um, complicated, again, long latency period. No insertional activation. Um, no transduction. Uh, <coughs> simply those, those viral gene products whose main job is regulation of transcription of the virus uh, after <coughs> rare events, we'll, we'll start a T-cell leukemia. It's interesting to say this, this is a virus that was on its way out evolutionarily. It's a lousy grower. It, it poorly transmitted. It was only kept for two reasons. One was that in certain places, the mothers masticated food for their babies. And this virus was in the saliva, I guess. And, and it <laughs> transferred to the babies and so there was a kind of cultural reason for it. And this is a virus that was found only in uh, Japan and in Europe for that reason. But the thing that really resurrected it was blood transfusions. Yeah. It's in the blood. And uh, before blood transfusions, there was no way to transmit it. I mean, all true. But I think HDLV was of interest in any event, as it as found as it was with ATL, yeah. um, a near it's fatal T cell leukemia and in TSP and other disease. So there, th it, has, it has interest in its own right as a no, disease no, no, causing it, virus. Yeah, it just was evolutionarily probably not going to make it until it yeah. changed the cultural. It's a good, good example of how cultural and um, medical advances cause cancer. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, we so, so we're good. Take a break for coffee. That's, that's good. I can, I can stop. Um, we talked about retro elements. We can talk about those more later. Um, we can talk about the inheritance of, of endogenous retroviruses in, in mammals and in primates like these. Um, and I'll just mention, as I did at the beginning, about the epidemic 
that's happening right now in the last few years in Australia uh, in the koala bear. And this is another xeno, uh, xeno um, transmission of uh, a gamma retrovirus, probably from mice uh, to koala bears in the north. And the disease is spreading down the coast. Um, and what's interesting is not only that it's a, a leukemia causing virus, um, but that it's entering the germline of the koala bears. Um, so in, uh, and we, we think of the introduction of these into, into the germline as rare and ancient and, and slow, but that's probably wrong. It's probably now we realize something that happens in the blink of an eye in evolution, uh, in, the, in the course of an epidemic, um, in, in just decades, which is nothing. Um, literally now tens and even hundreds of copies of this koala retrovirus are in the germline of koala bears. So when there is an epidemic of a lot of these viruses, not HIV uh, so far in humans, uh, can be introduced into the germline. And so uh, all these koala bears are gonna carry this virus forever uh, now um, it's a very sudden uh, expansion of this particular family member uh, into the germline of this species. It does threaten the species. Um, they're worried about it. They're isolating the animals that will not get infected to make sure they, uh, they survive. Um, but uh, the introduction into the germline is really a, a remarkable uh, recent observation. All right. So um, okay. I think I'll stop. Thank yeah. you.